train used to come by and pick up people, taking them uh, to uh, Charlotte. And there used to be tanks uh, on the side. I guess it was filled with uh, water or gas or what have you. And I think that's how it came to be known as Tank Town. Because this had been one of the oldest communities in uh, Mecklenburg County. And when I say oldest, it was one of the oldest African-American communities in Mecklenburg County in that it was started right after the Civil War. And by having my mom and my father explaining that to me, I begin to really understand that how important it is for us to maintain, not to be exclusive, but to be open, but to at least maintain the sense of community here. My dad, he worked on the railroad. I used to go up there with him, and I'd go up and sit on in one of the shanties and help and stay with him when he flagged down the train. My father's the only black mail man that ever been down here in this area. His name was Charlie McNeil. He carried the mail in the black community down here. Right. Just was called Tank Town. My mother ran a little general store across the railroad track over there. We had a little red store with the pool tables and stuff like that. And they sold sodas, chips, beer, stuff like that. And she would run that during the day. My father uh, worked for the railroad. He, was a, he did a number of things on the railroad, plus he was also a community activist. The uh, elementary school that I went to, and it was called Crestdale Elementary School. And it was a four-room school. And what I remember about it is the fact that every, everyone was so happy to go to school because you come to school and it would start with a prayer, and then you do the uh, Pledge of Allegiance to the flag right. and this. And, uh, and you get on, off on uh, with your business. And uh, you would learn uh, a, a lot during the time because of the discipline and because of the, the uh, personal uh, attention you got from the teachers. The persons who would stand out in my mind would be my uh, former school teachers that were here. Uh, Mrs. Ray being one of my first, my first grade teacher, or one of my second grade teacher, and Mrs. Bishop. Uh, and that's sitting right where we are sitting here. This is where our school was. So those are the two people that had some influence and that I remember. And we would have little programs at the school and the whole community would uh, get involved in it. And um, just uh, a very good experience. Typical summer day was getting up, shooting marbles, getting on your knees, shooting marbles, wearing long pants, of course, and wearing the knees of your pants out. My earliest memories would be like a day like this. That's perfect. A day like this, we'd be playing ball, whether it's the uh, guys playing the girls or another community like Pineville, Waxhaw, Munro coming up, and we would play them. And of course, I would play uh, baseball. So baseball practice was maybe two, three times a week, and then we'd have games on, uh, on uh, Saturday. Okay, now you see how the people got all the tents out? They would be cooking, it just wouldn't be tents. And they would have the black cast iron pots. Back then, people didn't have the portable grills and stuff like that. They used black cast iron pots, same ones that they washed clothes in, just the day you're frying chicken and fish in them and then somebody would have a box radio and they'd be playing the radio, we'd be dancing, you'd be playing ball, you have hot dogs, hamburgers, and then like I say, right up there where the two big trees are, where the horseshoe peg was at. Some people be pitching horseshoes. So you have horseshoe games going on, baseball, eating, music, stuff like that. One thing that I remember more than anything else is Harvey Boyd and I, we couldn't use the swimming pool at the Stars because at the time it was all segregated. And uh, so Harvey and I decided that since we can't use the swimming pool, we will make our own swimming pool. So uh, with the permission of my mom and my dad, we as a little guys, maybe 10 years old, got together and decided to dig us a hole in the backyard. <laughs> so he and I started digging and we dug <laughs> and we dug. <laughs> And we dug. And we dug a, a hole in the backyard. It may have taken us three or four days. Well, it was our swimming pool, maybe uh, 12 feet by 12 feet. 
uh, about four feet deep. Then we put cement around it, but we, and all this time my mom and dad knew what it would, that it wouldn't work, <laughs> but they didn't stop us. And we got it all done, we had it all done, and we decided that we would fill it with water and we were gonna charge kids in the area, you know, 10 cents to come in and swim because there's no swimming holes available. Filled it up with water from our, uh, our uh, at that time, we, that's before city water, but we had a well and a pump. So we let the, I let the water run all night and see what, what would happen. So we used the, uh, his mom's garden hose and we started filling. And we started filling this thing and we started filling this with water. And so it eventually the water was either the mud was covered in, the dirt was covered in. It took us about two weeks to fill this thing with water. But it became a mud hole. So finally we had enough water in there to hold and uh, we decided we would take the, the, the uh, maiden swim in the pool. So we jump in and step in and we go into mud about this deep at the bottom of the pool, up to our, above our anchors. It's all slush and mud. But we didn't care. It was our pool. <laughs> we, we were entrepreneurs, man. We were going to make some money to be able to say, well, we got our own swimming pool. We don't need that. <laughs> so it was fantastic. So it uh, eventually became a flower garden for his mom. Um, but we were very, we were lucky to have had that kind of parent that would let us do that in my backyard. Um, uh, I'm looking back on that. So that was one of the highlights. Going back to my father, he used to grow, uh, well, raise <laughs> uh, hens and hogs. Well, I left milk pen. I started with the milk there. I met, I met, we're milking 40 cows. I milk 20 in the morning, 20 in the evening. I go to school between 10. I hop milk in the morning at 6 o'clock. Have two bottles in this hand and two bottles in that hand and jump off the side of the milk truck. You see people jump off the truck, set them on the doorstep. I was 15 then. I go to the school, then I come out of school, then I go to milk, milk the cows in the evening, then hop back in the morning, six o'clock. When I was coming up, you, you might you get through playing ball and run back down through there and get your watermelon. You know what I'm saying? Run in Mr. Gamble's watermelon pad, get your watermelon. So now, 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 if somebody got a, a garden, it probably ain't no bigger than this tent right here. But when I was coming up, garden stretched from here to those big trees. Yeah. Y'all ran down the many rows, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Getting watermelons, corn on the cob, ears of corn. To we had a, a pretty large acreage of land in the back of the house and he would grow watermelons, corn, just whatever. And then he would share it with the community and sometimes he would just uh, go into other areas of Charlotte and just sell produce off his truck. Finest memory was the closeness of the people, uh, just knowing the people and knowing everybody, uh, pretty much. And there were no strangers here. Everybody knew me, or we knew each other. Growing up in Crestdale was a wonderful experience. Um, everyone knew each other, of course, and it was just a very close-knit community. And the word neighbor really meant something back then. And I think that's what I remember most of this community, is the fact that it, it, the, the fact that it was close enough, and um, there were enough people here, uh, elders, to keep us on a uh, straight and narrow. And when I, that's one of the fondest memories because I played with the guys. We grew up together, and now I see their extended family. I see their children, and I see their grandchildren. I say, wow, that's a stit, or that's a dut and they still live here, or somebody lives here. So that's still like a warm feeling. They may not know me as well as I know them, but at least I'm in my back of my head, I'm saying, oh, that's who that is.